Sustainable investing has received criticism in some circles for its lack of standards and scientific precision in determining how firms are evaluated and scored for various environmental practices. In short, some fund managers have been berated in the past for investing in stocks and bonds of companies with management policies and actions that lack consistency and focus in terms of environmental factors. In the view of IFA's investment committee, a notable ex exception to such skepticism has been dimensional fund advisors. Uh, as a result, we've invited Courtney Lee, a dimensional investment strategist, to discuss what questions investors need to be aware of in terms of evaluating sustainable funds. Hi, Courtney. Thanks for taking the time today to talk to us about such an important topic. Thanks for having me. Let's start out by reviewing just how Dimensional approaches sustainable investing. How do you folks choose between companies that are really doing significant work in this area? Yeah, uh, thanks, Murray. Uh, I, I wanna start off by sharing a quote that uh, in my opinion really embodies how Dimensional approaches sustainable investing. Uh, and that quote is, if I had only one hour to save the world, uh, I would spend 55 minutes defining the problem and only five minutes finding the solution. Uh, so for those of you who are familiar with Dimensional, you know that everything here is built on thorough and robust research. Uh, so when it comes to how we approach sustainability, it really is no different. We start with the science to first and foremost define the problem. Uh, and the problem as we and leading scientists define it is climate change is climate change. Uh, and greenhouse gas emissions are the primary driver of climate change. And then from there, we identify the data. You know, what data is available? Is that data relevant? Is it comparable? Uh, and then we use that data to systematically identify the companies that have high or low carbon footprints. Okay. Now, you folks have scored or ranked or compared how uh, your sustainability funds compare to leading funds from Avantis, iShares, Fidelity, Russell, the Russell 3000 Index, among others. Um, and it looks like on a number of different issues, your portfolios um, score uh, much higher. And I realize it's from your source, but it's using weighted averages for potential emissions from uh, different types of uh, uh, airborne reserves. Um, could you explain a little bit more about your ranking and scoring system? Yeah, of course. Uh, so we're, it, it comes as no surprise, uh, again, for those of you who are familiar with Dimensional, and for those who aren't, uh, you, you'll, become to, you'll come to know us for how thoughtful we are and how we approach everything, uh, but especially portfolio construction. So when we rank these companies, as Murray's referring to, uh, we take a hybrid approach. So uh, after we have uh, tilted the portfolio to higher expected returns, uh, we uh, take it a bit further and, and put on a sustainability overlay. And in that overlay, we both exclude the worst emitters and we employ a weighting scheme where we reward or overweight climate leaders relative to their peers uh, and punish or underweight laggards. So uh, a good example that I like to speak to is unlike energy and utilities uh, companies, financials is a, is a low emission sector but some companies have better sustainability practices than other, others, even within a low emission sectors, like se low emission sector, like financials. And that is really reflected in how we structure our sustainability portfolios uh, and how we have a very clear focused, targeted objective and thus can clearly report these things so that Murray can, can uh, compare us versus uh, other competitors in the field. Sure. And uh... In one of your recent research reports, um, you wrote, sustainability goes beyond re reduce, reuse, and recycle. Could you uh, go into more um, uh, detail about that? Yeah, of course. Uh, so the way that we view, I mentioned previously, uh, in our research, we have identified climate change as the, uh, the most important threat uh, to sustaining life on Earth uh, going forward. So as a result, once we identify that as the problem, it, it goes to, you know, how are we going to address that problem? So going beyond reduce, reuse, and recycle, we need to really identify those companies that are contributing the most to greenhouse gas emissions and reduce our exposure to those companies in particular. Okay. Uh, could you give an example? Uh, sure. 
so if you think about um, like an energy, the energy sector, for, for example, right, it's well known as being a high emission sector. So uh, we do not, we don't exclude the energy sector as a whole. Uh, mm -hmm. But when we look at companies, we, uh, we exclude the companies that have the highest emissions. But within the energy sector, there are companies that are doing things to reduce their carbon footprint. So we want to reward those companies, for example. Sure. And what do a company's emissions tell us about expected returns? So uh, I, we've done a ton of research in this area. I, I think it's safe to say at Dimensional, we're obsessed with trying to identify what the drivers of expected returns are. Uh, so with it, when it comes to ESG, uh, what we found is that ESG doesn't give a, any ESG considerations or data doesn't give us any additional information about expected returns beyond what we're already accounting for in our portfolios. Uh, so we're already accounting for what, how what we pay for a company, the size of that company, and uh, how profitable they are, are drivers of expected returns. Uh, so what we find is that that information about ESG considerations is already baked into those to those drivers that we already target. And in the earlier days of uh, ESG investing, I think there was a limited number of funds. Uh, limited number of resources. The data is much better today, isn't it? Uh, how can the investor expect in terms of portfolio performance, uh, long-term returns of a sustainable portfolio versus a regular um, uh, portfolio? Yeah, I, you have to be very thoughtful in your approach uh, and make sure that you're balancing the two, right? So uh, we've heard both sides. We've heard ESG leads to higher expected returns. We've also heard concerns from investors that ESG, you have to sacrifice returns in order to, uh, to pursue ESG. Uh, so what we find is uh, in the way that we design our portfolios to, uh, to, to target those drivers of expected returns, both in our sustainable and our non-sustainable portfolios, uh, we expect that to, to drive performance. And that's what we see in practice. Over the long term, if you compare our non-sustainable uh, portfolio with its sustainable counterpart, uh, you see the performance is, is is relatively in line. Okay, so you're pretty much neutral in terms of um, performance. Correct. Okay. Um, wh what about this issue of um, s some, especially in green bond funds, um, identifying what is actually a green project and what isn't? Yeah, so uh, one of the, the areas within ESG that is challenging is that uh, there's a lot of gray area, right? So identifying what is a good company versus what is an evil company is not realistic. Uh, yeah. So the way that we design our portfolios is to operate within that gray area. So a, a good example that I like to talk about is Tesla, for example. Tesla is well known as a, a low emissions company. Uh, there's no debate that their output is emissions-free, their vehicles. But there's some debate about its governance practices or the way it treats its workers who are mining the parts that go into the battery that powers that no emissions vehicle. So uh, in terms of identifying a good versus evil company, you can see even in a shining example such as Tesla, it's a lot murkier than, than it appears on, at, at first glance. So how do you screen those out? I'll, I'll, if I could just offer an um, example I heard recently from a fund investor who was frustrated with all the sustainable options and lack of standards. Um, he was pointing out that in his community, there was a big new project that they were put, issuing bonds for. They didn't get a whole lot of um, um, acceptance for the bond issue. And so they decided to put in um, test stations or uh, charging stations for um, electronic vehicles. So for electronic cars for Teslas. So uh, mm -hmm. then they relabeled these as green bonds. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a lot of that going on? And how do you uh, account for that? Yeah, that that's a fair uh, that's a fair example, and you're seeing a, a lot of that in the industry. Uh, the term that you're seeing attached with that, what you're describing, is called greenwashing. Mm -hmm. uh, so there has been a lot of talk about putting regulations in place so that 
uh, products or strategies that label themselves as green or label themselves as ESG uh, actually have to prove that they are what they say they are. Uh, so we're seeing that from a regulatory standpoint. Uh, but from our standpoint, I think one of the biggest benefits of the way that we approach things is that we do provide meaningful and transparent reporting. So you can, you, if we say that we're reducing our exposure to high carbon intensity companies, we provide reporting on a quarterly basis to, so that you can ascertain and see whether we're doing what we say, what we say we're doing. So you're double checking the company's own records, correct? Correct. Okay. Do you see the regulations and is this a ready for prime time market? I guess is my basic question. Uh, I, I think that you have to be very careful and work with a financial professional to uh, make sure that what you're interested in it, it is actually delivering what it says it's delivering. Sure. Okay. So I think we have a ways to go in that regard. Okay. Thank you, Courtney. I appreciate your time. Yeah, of course.